Well, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay with this microphone? Okay. Well, you have to ask yourself, barley yellow dwarf is a disease, and so why am I an entomologist talking about barley yellow dwarf? Uh, but the main reason is, is that the way we manage yellow dwarf is to, control, is to work on the aphid that spreads the virus. So um, that's why uh, I, as an entomologist, am spending this time on barley yellow dwarf management. Barley yellow dwarf that we call it, I kind of put it in quotes, it's really two different diseases. Not only, uh, they more or less have the same symptoms within the wheat. It also attracts, attacks oats and some of the other, other crops, but I'm going to focus on wheat. Uh, so one of them is called cereal yellow dwarf, and another one is called the, old, the barley yellow dwarf. I'm just going to try to remember to refer to them as yellow dwarf uh, diseases. But the symptoms are the same, the management is the same, uh, but the virologists uh, who work on this disease insist they're, you know, it's actually two. What goes on with, barley yellow, with the yellow dwarf viruses is that infection with them, uh, it, it affects the photosynthesis. It, it messes up how the uh, products of photosynthesis are translocated up and down the phloem. You end up with stunted plants. The tops are stunted. The roots are stunted, which is very critical, which means that, that, that you have a lot of, um, of, of problems because of that. Reduced tillering. Uh, the whole nine yards of things that would affect the, the, the kernel's weight and the number of kernels and, and, and all that sort of thing. And, and it, in some cases, if it's bad enough, you can see yield losses of up to 80%. So this thing can be a big problem. Mostly what happens is that it's a sneaky disease. It'll be out there in the field, but it won't be dramatic like having your field uh, wiped out by army worms or wiped out by hessian fly. But Year in, year out, it probably is responsible for more yield loss than our other insects that get on, uh, that cause problems in wheat. And uh, a, a survey that uh, Hank Van Riesen did years ago, uh, the average percent yield loss was what you can see there, 33 to 39 percent. So that's quite a lot that you're just subtly losing just from, from, from this disease. So I want to show you a few pictures of it and then talk a little bit more about how it's spread. Uh, you can see from here the, ye the yellow dwarf symptom, the, yellow, the yellowing of the leaves, especially the upper leaves. Sometimes the leaves turn red. It depends on the variety that you have of the wheat. Here's another one where it's turned red. So as I said, these yellow dwarf diseases routinely reduce wheat yield, but we can manage them. And so what I want to talk about today is the best kind of management strategies uh, for, for handling this insect and uh, handling this disease. And, and the key to, uh, I, I think, the understanding a little bit more about the, the, the aphids that bring it in and how they bring it in and how they spread it will help you understand a little bit more about that. So. It's not a hopeless problem like, uh, or a really tough problem to handle like the sugarcane aphid or the sugarcane beetle. Um, it's something that's really easy to manage and everyone who grows wheat should be managing for this insect. I mean, for these insects that spread the disease. So what are the players? We've got two different viruses that, caught, that spread it and each one of those have several different strains. We have several different aphids that will, will be involved in vectoring the disease. In red, I put the ones that are most important in Alabama. We have two strains of the viruses. We have our PAV and RPV. And as far as the aphids that get on wheat, there's like six of them that we do find on wheat, but two of them really, the rice root aphid and the bird cherry oat aphid are the primary ones that are, that are causing, uh, that are um, involved with the spread of, this, of this, these viruses. These uh, aphids, uh, I put three of them on this slide. You've already seen the corn leaf aphid up in the upper right that Scott showed that picture. Uh, it is known, it's a known vector, but it does, its timing of when it occurs in, in wheat seems to make it a very minimum uh, player in this. The, the two big ones are the, uh, the bird cherry oat aphid up there on the upper left and the little rice root aphid down here. Now the rice root aphid is sneaky because it most of the time is feeding on the roots as you can tell from its name and sometimes it'll come up and feed on the base of the plant. So what happens? How do we get started with this whole problem with barley yellow dwarf? 
Well, the aphids bring it in. This is a uh, slide that I stole from Ames Herbert, who stole it from uh, Dr. Harrington in England. But just so you remember that there's certain stages of these different aphids uh, ha have a winged form, and they come flying into the field. And in the process of coming in to colonize that field, that's how we bring in, they bring in the virus. Uh, when do they bring in the viruses? And this, this is a very busy slide, but what I want you to take home from it, this is the suction trap we had up in Guntersville, who ran it for several years. Uh, we're doing the number of aphids we trap per week. So it's set up as the dates the week at weeks after September 24th. So basically we wanted the fall season over here, uh, and, and then it goes on, and then the harvest season of wheat will be about here. See that corn leaf aphid, it's much more common, and we find it flying around much more in the summertime uh, when you might expect it since corn and, and sorghum are, one, are, are some of their hosts. But you can see that these aphids are starting, they're, they're bringing the aphid, the, the, they're flying, and we're catching them even into December. But most of this activity is occurring um, then there seems to be a lull when it's, when it's colder. We don't find them. We don't find them flying up here high in the air where we can, we can catch them in the traps. So the, the, these aphids are, are definitely a period when they come in, and they tend to come in in a sequence. Whoops. They tend to come in in a sequence, the green bug, which can cause some direct damage to wheat on its own but does not spread the, the southern strains of the of, of, uh, barley yellow dwarf and cereal yellow dwarf viruses, um, tends to come in earlier. And then the rice root aphid and the bird cherry oat, um, we, we find them, they're coming off whatever host they were on, and, and, and then they are also uh, out flying around and available to colonize wheat. Only a small percentage of the aphids, these winged aphids, are going to be carrying the virus. Uh, my graduate student did some work on this, and it was far less than 1%, and a 3% infection rate would be very, very considered very, very high uh, in terms of these aphids, um, how many of them are, are actually have the virus inside their body, and they're capable of transmitting that virus into the plant as they feed. So it's only a very, very small percentage. So this is meant to be my wheat field. I don't know if you can see that with my uh, nice um, reddish-brown Piedmont soil. And uh, then I've got some little green plants there. Now, the white, white circles, those are going to be aphids that are not carrying the viruses, and the yellow um, were the aphids that came in. So pretend that they all, all of those aphids land and, and start feeding on the, the wheat plants there. So there's only just a few. Uh, they may tend to be around the edges more than in the middle of the field just because of the way they're flying. They're, they're small insects, and they're flying in, and they're caught on wind currents and stuff, and they often will land in the shelter of a hedgerow. Uh, so you might find them more often on, on an edge of a field, particularly if, there's, if, it's a, a lot of, if it's got woods all around. Now, this is not a cereal aphid, but this is what's and showing what's very common when you go out early in the fall. Uh, when the weed is just coming up and you look and you'll see a winged aphid sitting there and that winged aphid will have a bunch of babies surrounding her just like this big potato aphid here has got these little babies. And if you look closely, she's giving birth to a baby right there. So they give birth to the, uh, 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 the living young and it doesn't take long before they grow up and ha start having babies on their own. And so as Scott mentioned, these aphids in general have a very large reproductive potential. So. Um, so anyway, so here we have the virus beginning to replicate in the plant if the aphid feeds on it and that virus gets in the plant. It's going to start growing. We've got aphids that are growing right on that plant. And after a certain period of time, the, 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 the titer, what they call the titer, the amount of virus in that plant is going to get high enough so that the, these aphids that are on the plant can pick it up as they're feeding these, these babies of, the, of, these, of that uh, winged adult that originally started there. And they can take that virus, and if they walk to another plant, you see they can move and they can feed on that plant and then infect that plant. So what we have is the first, first stuff that comes in with the winged aphids, we call that the primary spread of the virus. And then we have these uh, wingless aphids um, that are going to be moving around and spreading the virus from there on out until the next batch of flights, uh, some more flights of winged aphids occur. So as I said, most of this within-field virus spread is going to be due to these wingless aphids. So after a while, you could imagine 
that what might happen, and now pretend that these yellows are showing um, infected plants within our wheat field, you can see that um, the, these areas, depending on how the aphids move, will start getting bigger. And you will start, you, you could Im imagine that, that you would have uh, different patches. So I think this next slide is hopefully you're going to be able to see that there were actually a lot of patches in this field. If you start looking, there's little hits here. They call them yellow dwarf hits. So you can see there's one there, there's another one here. Um, now, they don't, once they're in a place, it's not like every single plant and every single tiller is going to be yellow. But, but you'll definitely see concentrations of yellow color that's sort of a, probably all of that is, is responsible for that hit, what we call that barley yellow dwarf hit, for started with just one aphid. Now, the earlier a plant is infected, the greater the yield loss, the more that plant, individual plant is going to be affected, it's going to be more stunted. Uh, but also, the greater the yield loss, even to the entire field, because if it becomes infected early and then aphids feed on it and then move to other plants in the field, uh, the chances are greater that there are going to be still more infected plants and more yield loss. So early infection is, is a lot worse than a later infection, and that is key for when you think about, if you think I'm going to tank mix an insecticide because uh, I have to go across the field anyway, there are times when that would make sense and there are times when that would not make sense because of, of this. Now, aphids are very are cold-blooded, so the warmer it is, the faster they're going to grow. If you get down below about 50 degrees, they're not going to be reproducing. They're kind of going to be sitting there. So for a good portion of the winter time, and I think Scott and I, we have talked about this, is that the aphids that come in in the fall, um, if there's not a lot of warm weather, are going to be more or less the aphids you have later on at the, towards the end of winter. Uh, they may have reproduced a little bit if we get a warm spell. It's obviously going to depend on Brenda's climate phases, like if the ones that were predicting a, a, some, a warmer winter in your region, uh, you would have a greater chance of aphid, aphid reproduction happening. But, but generally, uh, you have to remember that we're growing wheat uh, where, it's relative, where it's warm for a little bit in the fall, then it gets fairly cold, and then it warms up again. So always remember that, that those, those aphids, are because they're cold-blooded, they're just limited in how fast those populations will increase. Uh, this is an example uh, from David Bunton talking about the effect of planting data on aphid numbers in, in the winter wheat. And in this particular case, he's got three planting dates. And notice this red one. So if you plant early, uh, you're going to end up with more aphids in the fall. I drew a little line here sort of at December 1st. And then you're going to have sort of a, and then you're going to have in the springtime when these aphids do start building up because you had more here, you're going to have more uh, throughout the season. And uh, the later you plant, so this one was a um, uh, November 17th date, and this was a December so that you can see that uh, uh, there's fewer warm days, and there's less time for aphids uh, to uh, grow and, and, and develop. Here's another example where they actually had more development in the fall. It was more, must have been warmer, uh, so that in this particular year, there were, far, there were more, more aphids occurring uh, in the fall and uh, ready to um, start reproducing and moving around in the, once the weather warmed up in the, in, towards the late winter and early spring. Now, I put this in because I want to say that I am not saying plant late, because if you plant late, you'll avoid aphids, and you will. I didn't show you the slides, but you would also have much lower levels of barley yellow dwarf virus at the end of the season with late planting. There's a point where if you plant too late, and I think you guys, did you talk about that yesterday, Brenda, about planting date at all? Brenda's got a great publication about that that you should look up. And uh, you don't want to plant your wheat too late because you will be losing a lot of yield potential that way. So I have just put this in to remind myself that even though I'm saying that, you know, the later you plant, the fewer aphids you have, you have to keep in mind the best times for planting wheat in terms of getting your yield. And that this is what these dates are right here. So you can see whatever it is for, for your particular region. So we can kind of see that the number of aphids we have in the field before winter is going to depend on, uh, on, on several different things. We've got, we've got the planting date itself. We've got the number of the aphid flights that we have I mean, and the number of the flights and how big they were, how many aphids came in. 
and the weather, whether it, was whether it was favorable or not for the buildup of aphids. Natural enemies also come into play here. Sometimes natural enemies can, can clean up an infestation of aphids in the fall. And as I mentioned, the risk of the virus spread is also going to depend on the, the, the number of these aphids that you have that actually are carrying the virus itself. And that can vary from year to year. Now, we got a problem with our aphids in that they are very hard to scout for. They're often on the undersides of the leaves. The undersides of the leaves are a long, long way down, and the older I get, the further down they seem to be. Um, and the rice root aphids are very hard to find. A lot of times they're underground most of the time anyway. When the weather's cold, even the ones that might have been up on the leaf when these plants were getting bigger, those things are going to be down near the base of the plant too. So it's very, very hard to scout for aphids. And as you know, if anyone, if you ever heard me give talks or anything, you know that I'm always talking about make sure you, you know how many insects are there, you need to scout and you need to know how many are there and if there are enough, then that's the time to spray. So um, that's not what I say about burly yellow dwarf virus because it's very hard to scout for them to get accurate numbers. So what are we going to do? Um, more years than not, it's going to pay to control the aphids that are spreading burly yellow dwarf virus and serial yellow dwarf virus. Now, you might not, if you spray, you, there might be years where you don't win and there might be years where you win. But overall, you're going to come out further ahead if you try to control those aphids in some way. Various methods have been proposed, but the three most common ways to think about controlling your, the yellow, your aphids that are spreading the yellow dwarf viruses are to use an at planting seed treatment, to apply a uh, foliar application of insecticide in the fall about 30 days after planting, or to apply a foliar spray sometime in the late winter or early spring before the aphids really get going again in, in the springtime. Picking, you need to sort of pick which strategy is going to be most likely to pay off in your situation. Now, Scott Stewart has some beautiful data on this from Tennessee, so I want to start out with his data because it, ho it brings several different concepts into play here. So this is data, Scott, that you've been doing right, where you've been, you've been applying your insecticide sometime in the late winter, late January, early February, sort of. Um, he's got the number of years here. Um, it's got the number of bushels per acre increase over the untreated control. Now, what you can see here is in most years, you're going to have, you've got a positive thing here, positive return. Um, an average was 6.2 bushels per acre. Now, you notice that that wasn't guaranteeing that you were going to get 6.2 bushels per acre more every year, but on average, that's, that's what you had. So some years it was less, some years it was more. But overall, it paid to put on that application to kill those, kill those aphids in the wintertime. Comparing that, I'm sorry, I hope I didn't hit somebody in the eye when I just did the pointer instead of the... Uh, there we go. Compared to these seed treatments, here's, here's also a slide from Scott where they had data back to 1993, um, which is a huge data set, showing that on average his mean, mean yield response was three bushels per acre. So in, in Tennessee, um, uh, you know, on average when you look at that, uh, you, you come out farther ahead if you're only going to spray once to, to do, I mean, to, to control those aphids, you're better off to be controlling them in, in late winter. So what are we talking about in terms of thinking about those fall versus the late winter treatments? I've mentioned this already and talked about this, but I just want to reiterate that there's very little of the aphid reproduction and virus spread between about 30 days after planting and um, between the, the, this green up when the aphids start, start, start um, reproducing again. And depending on when you plant, there may be like no time for aphid buildup if you're planting late and then it turns cold right away. Uh, the best time for the foliar treatment might vary from crop season to crop season. So in some of those years, um, and Scott, I think in your email you mentioned that, that okay, if we treated perhaps in the fall one year, we might have had more return or we might have had less. You know, it just depends on when, the, when those aphids um, come into the field and how many of them there are. But the key is to 
control those aphids before they start to have that increase in the spring. Because it's that increase when the populations can, can, can grow so rapidly of the aphids in the, in the late winter and early spring. And that is a time when they move the virus around and the virus still has time to infect the plant and affect yield. All right, I just wanted to, to reiterate this concept. I put David Button's pictures back in here. I took the early planting out of this year. Um, and, and just sort of showing, here's like what I call the start of winter. I'm just calling that December 1st. So um, depending on the year, you might have more or less numbers of aphids here in the fall. And, but there's usually sort of this gap where nothing's happening in, the, in sort of what I call the, you know, the dead of winter is as cold as it gets down here. Um, so in North Alabama, this is what I would be advising, advising to do based on some of the data, and I'm going to show you a little bit of that if I have time. How am I doing on time? Okay, good. So um, for people that are planning towards the beginning of that recommended planting date, I'd call that sort of a more of the early planting season, I would say either a seed treatment or this foliar spray 30 days after planting could, I, would, would I think be the best way to go in this area. And then take a look, I know it's hard to scout for these aphids, but take a look in February, for example, right before some nitrogen is going on or before you're coming across the field with a herbicide or something like that. Go out when it's warm and look to see if you see some aphids. And if you do see aphids at that time, then put on that second, you might want to put on that second treatment. But if you're planning towards the end of that planting window or just after the end of that planting window, the chances are you're not going to have a lot of aphid buildup there in the fall, and 30 days after planting might take you, it might be Christmas or, or New Year's or something. So you're into that area anyway where uh, the, the thing to do would be to, to apply that foliar spray in late January to uh, late February. So uh, again, controlling those aphids, but if you're, if you're tending towards a forward end, uh, the earlier end of that planting window, then uh, you might consider that the uh, trying that fall 30 days after planting spray or, in, or using the seed treatment. I want to show you a little bit of data to kind of, I'm going to go through the regions and then give you a little bit of data to back this up. Central and South Alabama, it seems to be the way to go would be a foliar spray uh, late January to late February because generally they are um, planting a little bit later there and um, there's less buildup in the fall. Here's an example just sort of showing that uh, if you don't have pressure from insects, you can lose a lot of money by using an insecticide and in seed treatment on wheat. It's not like corn where in the southeast some kind of insecticide seed treatment is a good idea most of the time. So the only place where these are, this is the one of a bunch of tests that Kira Bowen and, and, and her colleagues have done here in, in Alabama to sort of show that the places where we see a positive return on using a seed treatment are in North Alabama, the Crossville, the Belmina areas like that. So um, seed treatments would, be, would might well be an option in insecticide seed treatment in, in, in the north. Here's an example um, in Griffin, Georgia, where getting at that point that um, based on when, it was, when the, the wheat was planted and the recommended planting dates and all, the, uh, the yield increase over the untreated, the higher bars were here where they were sprayed 30 days after planting, but they also got a good return uh, spraying when it was at full tiller, spraying when it was later uh, in the season towards late winter, early spring. What you do notice is, whoops, what you do notice here is spraying and heading doesn't do much for you at all. And that is because by the time you're spraying and heading, uh, any aphids that you're killing at that point are not going to, it's going to be too late in terms of if, if they were spreading burly yellow dwarf or serial yellow dwarf virus into the plants, that virus would not have time to replicate and affect yield. So uh, there's really no point in trying to control aphids to control uh, the yellow dwarf diseases uh, much later than I would say the 10th or 15th of March would be the very latest, and uh, February would be a better time to, to treat. Uh, this is an example with Leonard. I don't know if Leonard is here. I'll have to tell him I showed his slide. When he was working with the extension 
uh, system. He did a bunch of demonstrations in Otago County, which is in central Alabama. And in this case, this is where some of our data shows um, on the, these number of tests showing that you would get uh, a four bushel increase uh, by, by, by treating in, uh, the, in, in this uh, late, late winter, early, early spring time frame. This is from the coastal plain of South Carolina, but we've had similar results. Uh, David Button has in Georgia, and Kira has had similar results in, in Alabama. Uh, that when you get into this area where you're planting your wheat fairly late in the year, the best time to apply your insecticide so that you get fewer barley yellow dwarf symptoms here, and the highest yield is going to be spraying here. They were spraying on the 17th of February, which is very consistent with all the, the information that Scott, Scott has um, gathered over the years. So just want to show you that while there are local variations and it's going to somewhat depend on the weather that happens in the fall, um, uh, but, but generally treating those aphids at some point uh, before they start building up in the spring is key to controlling the disease. Um, I just want to point out in terms of insecticide seed treatments, we do have an option, several options, and I thank you, Scott, for putting this nice slide together. Uh, but notice the rates here, um, the amount of these materials that are being put on, because there are a bunch of seed treatments out there, Cruiser Max, some of the other ones, the, the new one with the, I can't think of the name of it now. But um, there, there's a lot of these that have a very, very low concentration of insecticide in that mix. So if you start looking at it, there's lots of different fungicides on that. But the, but the pounds of active ingredient or on a hundred weight of seed of these insecticides with some of these materials are very, very low. The cruiser vibrance, that's what I was trying to think of. So when you're looking at these, make sure that you're picking ones that have an adequate amount of active ingredient per acre. And these products here applied at about that 0.8 to 1 ounce rate are very, are very adequate for controlling your um, aphids in the areas where we've shown the seed treatments to work. As far as a foliar insecticide, we've had very good luck with the pyrethroids. The, uh, on the winter wheat, lambda cyhalothrin, zeta uh have been very effective and, and relatively long lasting. Now, as I mentioned, and I'm just going to mention it again because this is very important, spraying after, for aphids after March 15th is not going to substantially reduce your yellow dwarf. The only time where spraying for aphids later on might make sense is if you scout your wheat, if, as you're going out looking at your wheat and looking at it when the heads are emerging, if you saw a lot of an aphid called the English grain aphid, so if you saw 10 aphids or more per head when those heads are emerging, I'm going to show you what this aphid looks like. It's a big aphid. Uh, it's got these black cornicles. It's got these black, black antennae. Um, it'll be all clustered along the, um, the, the heads. So if you find a bunch of aphids on the heads of your, of your plant at head emergence, that would be the only time um, that I would recommend spraying for aphids after, after mid-March. And that's because these things can do direct uh, damage to the uh, weed itself by their feeding. I want to acknowledge that a lot of the data that we gathered here in Alabama was, uh, the funding was provided by the Alabama Wheat and Feed Grain Checkoff Fund. Uh, do we have time for questions? Yes. All right. Anybody have any questions? I guess I'd comment, Kathy, that when I've done that February spraying, at times I've had English grain aphids in the fields, and I've got beautiful pictures where when I spray them at that time, there's apparently not a lot of colonization going on in the spring, and they just don't come back. Yeah. So if I do it at that time, I'd never get English grain aphids in the heads. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen that in the unspray. Yeah. It's, it's remarkable how long that treatment effect will last, a lot longer than the insecticide lasts. Yes, it is. It's, it's sort of like it's just a population dynamic thing that, that it just seems to knock them back far enough. And so um, that's a good point. So any other questions? All right. Is anyone heartbroken if we move on to the next speaker early?